This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Fort Mill, South Carolina. We live in a modern, fast-moving time, and the population of Fort Mill has exploded in the last 20 years. I think the secret's out. That secret, Fort Mill's small town charm and hidden gems. Oh, it's a little piece of heaven. A piece of heaven where history and nature go hand in hand. The greenway blows me away. It's over 2,000 acres. It will never be developed. It will always be here. Diverse history flows throughout the community. For one brief moment, Fort Mill was the capital of the Confederacy and thick woods reveal a different secret. We were aware that her body was interred here. Once a major textile town, today suburban growth fuels Fort Mill's second boom, creating an urgency to preserve the past. You become invested in your community when you know something about it and you can relate to those things. That's why we feel uh, uh, that it's really a mission to collect these things and make them available for future generations. Coming up on Trail of History, the Ann Springs Close Greenway and Historic Fort Mill. The following episode of Trail of History is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Bragg Financial Advisors, a family-owned wealth management firm providing investment management and tax and estate planning for families, individuals, and institutions for more than 50 years. Committed to our clients, to education, and our community. For those seeking a slice of small town Americana, Fort Mill, South Carolina offers just that. We've always had a good time on the bandstand and just congregating and getting to see you, your buddies and everybody. But there was a time Fort Mill lost a bit of its charm. And it was getting pretty bad from a, just from the buildings themselves, not being occupied, not being maintained. You know, in fact, people started using more of the buildings as just storage because they could get cheap rent to just store stuff. Where others saw a reminder of what used to be, entrepreneur Ed Curry saw potential. When we moved here, Main Street was pretty much dead. There were a few businesses that had been here for a long, long time, and I just saw, you know, that old historic flavor that's right here, and it, you know, it made me feel, you know, I got that feeling inside, this is where I needed to be. Curry owns Pucker Butt Pepper Company, home of the Carolina Reaper Pepper, this right here is Reaper Squeezins. We're known for the, the Guinness World Record for the hottest pepper in the world. We make a pepper mash out of it, as well as a variety of condiments, candies, spices, all sorts of other stuff. Curry runs his pepper empire right here on Main Street, taking part in Fort Mill's revival. You know, in a shopping mall, we probably get more revenue, you know, and we'd, we'd probably have a lot more uh, exposure. But Fort Mill uh, has treated us really well. The city is phenomenal. The people here are phenomenal. Running a business out of century-old buildings comes with challenges. There's a lot of repairs that need to be done. For example, we're a federal canning establishment here. And uh, we had to redo the whole floor in the kitchen just to uh, get back up to code. You know, and things break quite often, but we just fix them up and keep on moving. Literally, this area is building so much uh, that new businesses are being attracted in, and I'm really glad we were a part of building this up. Curry is one of the thousands who relocated to Fort Mill, adding to the hustle and bustle in this small southern town. You can't get through Main Street in five minutes, <laughs> but that's progress, and along with that comes many good things to the community. So you might think finding a bit of tranquility could present a challenge. But on the outskirts of Fort Mill, you'll find horses grazing in rolling pastures, a swinging bridge over a clear stream leading you off on a trek, and historic cabins that harken to a simpler time. 
It's probably one of the unspoken of or maybe unheard of gems in this area. That gem, the Ann Springs Close Greenway. It's over 2,000 acres and in 1995, it was dedicated to Mrs. Close uh, for her love of nature and is, is in perpetuity. It will never be developed. It will always be here. So we have her children to thank and Mrs. Close also. I didn't own one acre of it. My children owned it. My father had left it to my eight children. Undivided share, so they all had to agree to, before they could do anything. In this, at the same time, there was a lot of pressure on us to sell some land to develop. The developers were just dying for some land. And uh, I was told that we were holding back progress by not developing anything. The Greenway is not tax supported whatsoever. It is a private entity. It is supported by sponsors, by members, by various groups that are active here on the Greenway. I had played in these woods and these creeks as a child. That's what we did back then. We had no TV or radio or Nintendos or whatever, so we played outdoors all the time. And I loved the woods and I wanted to save some of it so that my children and everybody's grandchildren would have somewhere where they could be close to nature. Most of the what is now Greenway, a lot of it was in farmland, peaches and corn and cow, a lot of cows. And farmland was disappearing at a very rapid rate in North and South Carolina, especially around the Charlotte metropolitan area. The Greenway promotes the area's local history. My name is Flora Doraski, and um, with my husband Joe, I volunteer here at the Greenway. We love it. We are retired, and we um, uh, do this as our volunteer activity. The Greenway blows me away in that there are many different eras that are covered in the Greenway. Together, Flora and Joe lead educational tours and use the Greenway as a backdrop to talk about nature and history, including a program for Fort Mill fourth graders. During that, these fourth grade students come to the Greenway and they experience how this area has been used over the last few hundred years, starting with the Catawba Indians. Almost everywhere you go, you'll find a link to the past and the longest. We have here on the Greenway, the longest undisturbed stretch of what is left of the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road. The Great Philadelphia Wagon Road led 700 miles from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, down through the Shenandoah Valley, across North Carolina, through here on South Carolina, down to Augusta, Georgia. And then, of course, there's the history part that we know. Lord Cornwallis and his army came down this road in the latter part, the latter times of the Revolutionary War. And then, of course, it, at one time, George Washington, when he was making his tour of the South after the Revolutionary War, he came up this road. Near the wagon road sits two log cabins, each saved from demolition when the Greenway relocated them from nearby farms. We are located at the Graham Cabin. The Graham Cabin was originally uh, about three miles down the road on Highway 160. It was built around the early 1800s. It is a two-story cabin, uh, which is unusual really for the time and the logs themselves have been certified as uh, chestnut wood. The uh, notoriety of this wonderful cabin is that I think it was the great grandfather of the Reverend Billy Graham who originally built this cabin. So that's why we feel so fortunate to have it here. The Ferris cabin is a smaller cabin than this one but it was contemporary with this cabin. They were all both built probably within 10 or 20 years of each other. 
and just down the road from each other. The Ferris cabin was moved here in 1995, a few years earlier than the Graham cabin was moved. And it was a little easier to move because it is a smaller cabin. It's very neat because at one time, probably as many as 10 people lived in the Ferris cabin. And an interesting thing about it too, while the Graham cabin was remodeled, so to say, to speak, uh, to look more like a regular farmhouse with siding, the Ferris cabin was never changed. I like to sit out on the porch and look out over the pasture land and just imagine myself living in the cabin because it has such a, an aura about it that just embodies the whole spirit of this area of the Greenway, the peacefulness and the beauty. Up on a hill surrounded by pastures sits the Dairy Barn, an iconic building at the Ann Springs Close Greenway. It was built in 1947. I've never seen a dairy barn that, that's that big before, and it was actually used for about 40 years. Renovations gave new life to the old dairy barn, transforming it into an elegant and rustic setting for special events like weddings and receptions. Their commitment to history didn't stop with the cabins and dairy barn. The other thing we did, and we had to start from scratch there, uh, was a grist mill, and that was actually the very beginning of Fort Mill. The man built a grist mill on Steel Creek, and the settlers all came there to have their corn ground into flour or grits. Using an archaeologist to pinpoint the original location of the mill, a replica grist mill was constructed at the Greenway. And it's stuck back in the woods, which is so neat because when people, you have to get there, you have to walk there, you have to hike there to see it. And then you walking down the trail and all of a sudden, there's this neat grist mill. Offering some insight into the town's namesake, the mill in Fort Mill can be traced back to that old grist mill. And according to historians, the fort comes from a small earthen fort in the area during the 1700s. The fort, a lot of people imagine a fort with walls and, and imagine the logs on the side with, with all of that. It was more of a burn type fort that was never completely finished, but it was built and that was on the south side going toward the river. This structure was built to protect the European settlers and Native Americans in the area. The Native Americans who had lived here, the, the ones that we know the most about would be the Catawba Indians. Catawba have been hunting and living in this area uh, for, we're surely from the 1600s and, and before. The Fort Mill area is actually the home of six, I believe, of the major Catawba towns. One of them having been discovered a few years ago up on the river. Take a stroll around Fort Mill and you'll spot pieces of history just about everywhere you look. Historic homes, buildings, and forgotten places all have stories to share. Just a few miles north of the town sits Springfield Plantation, built sometime between 1790 and 1806. Springfield was built by John Springs III, and he was the son of Richard Springs. Thirteen panes of glass surround the home's entrance. According to family tradition, to be the design by John Springs because of the 13 colonies. So there's 13 panes to represent the colonies. The plantation was eventually passed to John's son, Andrew Baxter Springs. He served in both the South Carolina State Legislature and the Confederate government. As the Civil War came to an end, Confederate President Jefferson Davis and his cabinet stayed at the Springfield Plantation and made history at the nearby White Homestead while fleeing Union troops. President Jefferson Davis and the, uh, most of the cabinet members called a meeting on the front lawn of the White Homestead. And uh, the purpose of that was to accept the resignation of the Secretary of the Treasury, George Trenum. At the last cabinet meeting itself, um, which is uh, sort of like wherever the cabinet meets is the capital of the Confederacy. So for one brief moment, Fort Mill was the capital of the Confederacy. The end of the Confederacy solidified the freedom of more than three million slaves. My name is Rufus Sanders.
and uh, better known as Rudy here in Fort Mill. Rudy's making his way to a sacred, almost forgotten place on the outskirts of Fort Mill. We are at the old Macedonia Presbyterian Cemetery. However, the church uh, stood on, uh, on Steel Street. But this was the cemetery back in the turn of the century, 1900. We're leading up to the path to Lucy Pfeiffer's grave. But Lucy's story didn't start here. Lucy Pfeiffer was a lady that was born enslaved in 1844, 43 miles up the road north of here in Cabarrus County. She was born on the George Pfeiffer Plantation. She married Jack Pfeiffer. Who was a slave on the same plantation. And there, they had children. And then after slavery, in 1880, Jack found that he could not make ends meet as a tenant farmer. And he heard about this colonization going back to Africa. Lucy, Jack, and their children boarded a ship and traveled across the Atlantic to the African nation of Liberia. After arriving there, uh, they were skin and bones. Jack and, uh, and two of his daughters and one son would meet devastation along the way. They died of tropical fever. To add to the heartbreak, their daughter Lily lost a foot due to an infection. Lucy decided she'd had enough of Africa. She and her remaining children returned to the United States and settled in Fort Mill. There, she worked for Esther Pfeiffer White, a descendant of the man who once owned Lucy as a slave. There is a cabin uh, right adjacent to the founder's house. And this cabin was given to Lucy and her two children, Lily and Silas. Uh, that cabin is made out of brick and it stands today. That cabin is a testimony of, of her life here. An extraordinary life. In her later years, Lucy worked for a local doctor as a midwife, helping deliver children like... First hands to touch William Rufus Bradford Jr., who was the former editor of the Fort Mill Times, was the hands of a former slave that was born in 1844. Known to some as Aunt Lucy, she passed away in January of 1930. Fort Mill's early prosperity is closely linked to the coming of the railroad and textile mills. The first train came through Fort Mill actually on July the 4th, 1852. Of course, the railroads were very important for Fort Mill. That's what really made Fort Mill where it is now. Well, in 1852, when the rail line came through, of course, that kind of moved everything this direction. In textiles, two families led the way, the Springs and the Whites. Andrew Baxter Springs' son was Leroy Springs. Leroy Springs uh, built the Lancaster Cotton Mill over in Lancaster, South Carolina. He married Grace Allison White, the daughter of Sam White. Sam White built Fort Mill Manufacturing Company, which was the start of Springs Cotton Mills and Springs Industries. In 1904, Leroy Springs took the helm from his father-in-law, Sam White. And uh, Leroy, being that tenacious businessman that he was, went uh, to north to the banks and uh, got loans and, and advancements and modernized the mills and added actually more mills to these. When Leroy died in 1931, his son Elliot White Springs, a World War I pilot, returned to Fort Mill to run the mills. It was under his leadership that Springs Industries, with the Springmate brand, grew to become one of the largest employers in South Carolina. That is, until the downturn of the American textile industry. In the post-textile years, Fort Mill found new ways to prosper. So we live in a modern, fast-moving time, and the population of Fort Mill has exploded in the last 20 years. Leanne Moore says the town's rapid growth makes the work she does here at the Fort Mill History Museum critical. The Fort Mill History Museum was founded to collect and preserve and present history of the town, in artifacts and oral history and other forms. And if we don't have a way to preserve and present the history to people today and tomorrow, then it becomes lost. Take a stroll through the museum and you'll find exhibits showcasing the Catawba Indian Nation, textiles, life on Main Street, and those who serve the country at war. One of the interesting things is the employee booklets 
from Fort Mill Manufacturing where they came in how many hours they worked and the little machine that they calculated their pay. It's all inside the old Wilson house. And we finally settled here in the Wilson house which was built in 1869 um, on Claiborne Street here. It was actually on Main Street. It was one of the first homes built on Main Street when it was called Trade Street at the time. And then it was moved around the corner here. The museum puts an emphasis on capturing the stories of some residents before they're gone. When the museum was just a thought, not even an actual place yet, one of those founders, Elizabeth Ford, began doing interviews with local residents about their memories of Fort Mill. And those ended up on a hard drive and no one really knew about them. The Elizabeth Ford Living History Project is ongoing and currently includes 16 interviews from various Fort Mill residents. We have hours and hours of footage that we keep as an archive and we also have transcripts, written transcripts to go with it. And as we are able, we edit packages from that on different topics. It's fine to look at a photograph, it's great to read something someone's written, but to hear somebody tell you what it was like because they lived it is an immense resource and one that we can't replicate by just putting something on the walls. We have a small space here. This is a historic home, so obviously we can't do everything we want to do in the building. So we take a lot of our mission outside the walls and we go out into the community to do things. And one of those things is our trunk program, trunk in schools. And we have history trunks that we take to schools and to homeschool programs. Trunks like this allow you to take learning outside of the museum, full of resources designed to help you learn about Fort Mill's history. Or you can grab a brochure and take a self-guided walking tour along Main Street. Several times a year, staff members lead guided tours, including an annual historic homes tour. Remember the site of the last meeting of the Confederate cabinet? The White Homestead is one of the stops. The White Homestead um, was built by William Elliott White and Sarah Robinson Wilson White, built around the 1830s, 1832 to 34. Still stands um, as it originally was constructed, four floors. Um, it is a federal style structure, completely um, a brick structure, no, no framing. Its um, foundation goes down more than six feet and it's a, it's a lovely home. In the fall of 2017, staff members led the way through the darkness on the Lanterns and Legends Tour, a creative way to get people involved in Fort Mill's history. In 1902, if you had been here at, at about 4 o'clock in the morning, you would have heard a loud explosion rip through Main Street. When people interact with the museum, whether it's here in the building or on one of our tours or one of our outreach programs, what we want to, them to get from that experience is that this is a very vibrant place and also to take that history and look at what it's allowed us to have and to build going forward is something that's important and we think that that's something people appreciate. Fort Mill has seen its share of change from the time of the Catawba Indians to settlers traveling down the Great Wagon Road to the time of the cotton plantations and the Civil War then the textile boom and eventual bust. But today, this community is in the middle of a renaissance. With all of the infusion, you get a lot of diversity. You get a, meet a lot more folks. Of course, you got the headaches of the traffic and stuff like that, but I would much rather be in somewhere where it's, where it's growing than to be in the middle of somewhere where it wasn't. And with amenities like the Ann Springs Close Greenway. It's, it's almost given us a buffer. So that's one of the things that I like because I love going out to the Greenway being able to do that, but it also keeps us from getting encroached in and lose our identity because too many times I think you can get absorbed into something and then, but we've, we've been able to keep what makes Fort Mill special. The historic charm of a Main Street that's still giving up secrets. We, we find comfort in those architectural designs and in the simplicity sometimes of the early um, 1900s, the late 1800s styles, um, and, and you know, it has history. <laughs> and that's, that's the thing, it has place and time. It has a story, and we all love a story. This is like hometown Americana, you know? This is the, when you, when you take the off the highway <laughs> way to go to someplace, 
Everybody here is family. We all know each other's names. We all know each other's families, and we, and we work together to keep that atmosphere. But don't let that small southern town vibe fool you. Today, Fort Mill is one of the fastest growing communities in the state. Between the town's dedication to preserving history and bringing Main Street back to life, Fort Mill shows no sign of slowing down. So I guess it's safe to say the secret's out. Thank you for watching Trail of History right here on PBS Charlotte. production of PBS Charlotte.